Good morning, I'm Fred Mondurant. On behalf of the Lee Coast Chapter of the Military Officers Association of America and the City of Sanibel, welcome to our Veterans Day celebration. And before I go any further, I know all the Marines are waiting for me to acknowledge that yesterday, November 10th, was the 245th anniversary of their founding. Congratulations. A hundred years ago, the war to end all wars took its toll on the youth of the world. Veterans Day began as a celebration of the armistice for that war. While Memorial Day honors veterans who have passed, Veterans Day honors all veterans. Today, less than 1% of our citizens answer their nation's call to military service. Several years ago, we began the tradition of celebrating our ceremony in recognition of a Sanibel veteran. Our first honoree fittingly was Francis Bailey. This year, we'll be honoring a longtime Sanibel resident and World War II hero, Ed Sieber. Also this year, we will again honor one veteran representing all the veterans on the Sanibel City workforce. As we prepare to present the colors, I'd like to say a couple things. This morning's flag ceremony is being presented by the scouts of Troop and Pack 1740. And the members participating, the scouts are Kenny Coral, Kyler Coral, Ronan Maughan, Alex Erickson, William Erickson, Christopher Erickson, Liam Tritek, Jack Powers, Ryan Powers, Riley Horvath, Liam Horvath, Nathan Ames, Kerry Cowfold, I'm sorry, Henry Cowfold, and Levi Jackson and Ryder Jackson. They will be raising a flag assisted by Santa Barbara police officers, Chad Make, Max Bernier, and Michelle Rose. Thanks to Lieutenant John Smith for organizing the flag ceremony and working with the scouts. I also want to acknowledge the adult scout leaders, Scout Master Jason Maughan and Assistant Scout Masters Paul Tritake and Brian Boyd. Ronan Maughan will be leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance. After the pledge, we'll play the national anthem and then we'll post the flag.
going to 1740 the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This beautiful new monument at the base of the flagpole is a result of a vision, perseverance, and diligence. Kenny Coral did this for his Eagle Scout project. Kenny grew up on Sanibel, attending the Children's Center of the Island and the Sanibel School. Currently, he attends Canterbury High School, where he is a member of the National Honor Society. I'd like to introduce Kenny Coral and ask him to tell us about his project. Good morning, my name is Kenny Coral, and I'm here with Troop 1740. Before I begin, I'd like to thank a few people for supporting my Eagle Scout project, which is a veterans and first responders memorial here at, city, at the city of Sanibel. I'd like to thank the city of Sanibel, the city manager, Judy Zamamer, the city council, Bob and Lisa Walsh, Luke Mancusu at R.S. Walsh, everyone else at R.S. Walsh, Mr. Tom Mueller, all the members of Sanibel Captiva Kiwanis, Kim Owens of Trophy Case, Mr. and Mrs. Jacobson, my aunt and uncle, Mr. and Mrs. Ruling, my brother, mom, and dad, and Troop 1740, and Sanibel Community Church. Without any of you, I couldn't have done what I have done today. The reason for my project is pretty simple. I thought that there was an underrepresentation of uh, our first responders and veterans, and I just decided that I would make it my job to represent them and honor them with my Eagle Scout project. So it's supposed to pay homage to our heroes in our society. And the definition of heroes can be uh, defined in many different ways, but the one that I'm going to be using today are the veterans, the police officers, the firefighters, the doctors and nurses, and the paramedics that every day serve us and protect us in our communities. 
without them, we would be a much different society, and I am greatly thankful for them. Thank you for the opportunity to recognize them, and God bless America. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce one of Sanibel's newest residents. He's the new rector at St. Michael's and All Angels Church. Please welcome Father Bill Van, Ra Van Ost to give our invocation. Let us pray. Gracious God, today we honor our veterans, worthy men and women who gave their best when they were called upon to serve and protect our country. We pray that you will bless them for their unselfish service in the continual struggle to preserve our freedoms and our safety. Bless them abundantly for the hardships they faced, for the sacrifices they made for their many different contributions to America's victories over tyranny and oppression. We respect them, we thank them, we honor them. We pray that you will watch over these special people and bless them with peace and happiness. Be with all the men and women who make national policy that they may be guided by the spirit of peace. Strengthen our efforts as leaders of nations to work with other nations in deeds which will enhance the common good. Forgive us as individuals who fail in our own citizenship. We thank you for the privileges of life and the blessings we enjoy through your graciousness to our nation, the land in which we are given the freedom of speech, religion, and the pursuit of happiness. May we always remember that our rights require responsibility for their proper use. On this day when we honor the women and men who have served our country in war and peace, may we rededicate ourselves to serving others for a greater good. In your holy name we pray, amen. Now I'd like to talk about the Chair of Honor. You'll see this at many public events, sporting uh, arenas, stadiums and the like. This empty chair serves as a memorial to those who served in the military of our nation but did not return. They are our prisoners of war and missing in action. America will forever be grateful for the bravery and sacrifice they made for our nation. We can never forget them. To recognize uh, some special guests today. First of all, Vice Mayor Mick Denham, Councilwoman Holly Smith, Councilman Richard Johnson. Councilman Jason Maughan, who's joined by his son Ronan, who led us in the pledge today. <laughs> we also have with us our Mayor Kevin Ruane, and I'd like to invite Kevin to come up and say a few words. Good morning. Today I'm proud to be standing as the Mayor of Sanibel and recognizing our partnership with the Lee Coast Chapter of Military Officers Association of America. The Military Officers Association of America is an association of 350,000 military officers, including active duty, retired, National Guard, reserves, and former officers and their families. It is an independent nonprofit and politically nonpartisan organization. Their, their focus includes military personnel matters, especially in regards to legislation affecting the associated communities. We live in an incredible diverse nation. Our veteran population is over 23 million people and counting. As Americans, we seek in our communities those who have wore the uniform to recognize them this Veterans Day. On this Veterans Day, let us thank God for the gift of freedom made possible by those who served our nation with honor, courage, and commitment in our own armed forces during all wars that enabled us so many of them to earn the title of American veteran. On behalf of the City Council, the Sa City of Sanibel, it gives me great pleasure and pride to praise our current troops and all the veterans for allowing us to enjoy our safety and freedom that we take grant for granted every single day. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce our city manager, the glue that holds all this together, 
makes everything work, Judy Zamama. I'd now like to recognize the 19 veterans among the city workforce. We have eight Army veterans. John Agnew, city attorney. Max Bernier, police officer. Samuel Halverson, public works tradesman. James Isom, director of administrative services. Christopher Queck, public works. Kelsey Reed, operations manager, public works. Michelle Rose, police officer. Sabine Schroeder, community services, records. We have three Navy veterans. Rod Bell, public works tradesman. Mike Claney, IT servicer, uh, server administrator. Arthur Stallsmith, public works maintenance tech. We have five Marines on the workforce. Matthew Fannin, rec center maintenance supervisor. John Hall, police aide. Joshua Oyman, planner, community services. Christopher Salter, public works tradesman, and Anthony Thompson, deputy police chief. The two Air Force veterans are Chad Make, police officer, and Timothy Moore, police aide. We have one Coast Guard alumni, Courtney McCarthy, senior police dispatcher. I'd also like to mention that our local fire department also has five veterans, two from the Coast Guard, Todd Walter and Clifford Steele, one from the Army, Joe Nygaard, and Brian Howell and John DeMaria from the Navy. I invite students in the Rec Center after school program to enter our essay contest. Additionally, this year we also invited students at the Sanibel School and homeschoolers to participate. Commander Doug Quelch, U.S. Navy retired, has organized this program and judged these essays for many years. And I want to thank him for his continued support. This year there were 19 entries and the topics were the importance of Veterans Day, why we celebrate Veterans Day, and a member of my family who was a veteran. I'd like to introduce the winners who will read their essays, and I'll also present them with an award in the form of a check generously given by the Bank of the Islands. Also, Commander Quelch has actually typed their essay and framed it for them. So as the first one I would like to invite up to speak is Emma Dellenbach, a sixth grader. Hi, I'm Emma Dellenbach and I'm so honored today to be here around all these amazing veterans. Here's my essay. Why we celebrate Veterans Day. Veterans Day is a very important holiday. We celebrate it because people in the military do so much for us. They have to leave their family, put their life on the line, and work day and night. I personally know how important Veterans Day is. I have a family wall in my home that shows how much of my family was in the Army. That wall is very important to me. I love looking over at that wall and thinking of all my family fighting for our country. Also, I have an uncle currently in the Army, and I see how much he serves our country. I think that thanking veterans is so important. When we celebrate our veterans, it makes them know we love and appreciate each and every one of them. The time and effort they put into our country is unspeakable. I think that Veterans Day is one of the most important holidays. Thank you, Emma. Thank you. Next, I'd like to introduce one of our honorable mention, Christopher Erickson, grade four. I chose to write about Alex, Alex McKenzie because of his career. First, he was born in New York in 1937. Second, he was in the military. Here are some things of what he did. First, he was in the Air Force. Second, he was a navigator in the Air Force. Third, he served in Vietnam in 1965. He helped our country by, like I said, serving in Vietnam. He had four family members. He had four family members that were, our, that were in the military. First, Ida McKenzie. His wife was an Army nurse in Vietnam. He helped, she helped wounded patients. Second, his father, Alex McKenzie. He served in World War I in 1970. His sons, Scott and Sean McKenzie, was both, were both in the Air Force too. Scott was in the Air Force, and, and Sean still serves in the Coast Guard. He served at four bases. I'm proud to be his grandson. My grandpa was in the Marines. He was a photographer and a reporter at base. He did a good service 
to America before he died of leukemia, and that brought together my tradition. When I wake up and go to bed, I act like I'm praying for a minute and I re and remember what he did for America. He did a great service and and he never gave up no matter how tough the challenge was. He was a great man and I and I mean that. In my view, my grandpa is one of the kindest people on earth. And that's why I celebrate Veterans Day because I support veterans in their fight for our freedom. Veterans Day is on Wednesday, November 11th, and has been for 66 years. President Eisenhower declared Veterans Day on November 11th. We celebrate Veterans Day by having parades and we hang a lot of American flags. We also have a moment of silence and thank the soldiers for us. It is held at 11 a.m. Long ago, soldiers got paid with salt. Veterans Day is important because it honors the soldiers who fought for us. My great-grandfather served in the Navy in World War II. Two great-uncles were in the Army in World War II. One grandfather served in the Army and another served in the Navy, as did my stepmom. Thank you for reading my, choosing my essay. Oh, beautiful, for spacious and for amber waves of grace. For purple mountain majesties above the fruit is laid. I'm proud to introduce our speaker today. He's a former Navy Lieutenant. Fulfilling a lifelong ambition, he entered the Aviation Officer Cadet Program, graduating first in his class, and was awarded his Navy Pilot's Wings and his Officer's Commission. He was an A-6 pilot and stationed on the USS Independence. He participated in the 1973 Middle East War and the 1974 Cyprus Conflict. Later, he was an uh, instructor at the Naval Advanced Training Command for Naval Flight Officers. His final years of active duty were with the Blue Angels Naval Aerial Demonstration Team. Commissioner Sandelli is currently serving on the County Board of Commissioners as well as several charitable and civic organizations. I'd like to introduce Commissioner Ray Sandelli. Well, good morning, and thank you for inviting me to participate in this program. I'm truly honored. You know, when many of us hear the word veteran, certain images sometimes come to mind. It might be the sight of a neighbor wearing a baseball hat adorned with a military emblem. Perhaps it's the coverage of an angel flight bringing past warriors to and from our nation's capital. We're simply noting a picture of a family member or a friend, much younger days in their uniform. And always that meaningful exchange Thank you for your service. With perhaps age, I've often thought about what was actually given to us when we chose to serve. That initial chaos of boot camp with the drill instructor who loudly assured us we had absolutely no place in his military. New friends who you suddenly ate, slept, and trained with as we developed a trust and commitment to each other no matter the challenge. Then given the responsibility to be entrusted to defend the freedoms we all enjoy. It gave us a very focused sense of purpose and certainly an immense pride as part of something much larger than ourselves. It also exposed us to the realities of a profession that could suddenly take as much as it gave. It tested us in ways not imagined at times end result taught us how to deal with loss and how very precious life is. We grew up fast. 
When tested, new thresholds expanded beyond where we thought limits existed, had immense fun and scared ourselves only to rise up the next day and do it all over again. We learned how very fortunate we are to be Americans as we saw the best in some cases and the very worst in the realities of the world community. Most important, we formed a brotherhood that endures. I find myself a long time ago finding my grandfather's World War I uniform in a closet. Years ago, my father's from World War II and always wondering what stories those uniforms held. For many like ourselves, our uniforms now hang in our own closets, a remembrance of a time of youthful exuberance, endless energy, curiosity, and creating legends, sometimes in our own minds. While our reasons varied, wearing the uniform was a calling we will always be thankful for. I now have the privilege to be part of the team interviewing applicants for all the U.S. military academies. As each of these exceptional young men and women take their turn in the hot seat before us, it always makes me think of where they are in their personal journey. While only a few will receive appointments, I have every confidence all will do very well in their lives due to their accomplishments to date and their desire to serve. They are among the very best of the next generation and give me great hope in America's future. Now, some have asked me what was it like over the past year when the governor suddenly called me to serve. It was somewhat unexpected, but not the first time of a rapid transition. Short story. I wanted to join the Navy and fly since I was a young man. I hung around the recruiting stations. I had every decal and poster I could carry home. I built model airplanes. I would work at an airport and somebody would take me around the pattern once. Perhaps a Tom Cruise in the making long, long before Tom Cruise. So two weeks after I graduated from college, I headed off to Pensacola for officer candidate school and upon commissioning flight training. I was ready, or so I thought. With a new haircut, pressed civilian clothes, and my gym bag, I set foot at Naval Air Station Pensacola. With map in hand, I searched for the building I was to report to. Ahead of me was a young group of men in baggy green flight suits, shaved heads, and a tall, lean, lean guy who was addressing them in an octave just shy of what an afterburner might sound like. Please, I wonder what these guys did wrong. But figuring the guy in the smoky bear hat knew a lot, I'll just ask him. Brilliant. So I interrupted his instruction by tapping him on the arm. He turned and looked at me, incredulous at my action. Excuse me, I inquired. Can you tell me where Indoc is? His reply, right around the corner, sweetheart. Interesting response. So I walked around the corner and was greeted by two candidate officers. I gave them my name. They welcomed me, directed me to a door that above it read, through the store, passes the future of naval aviation. With unbridled enthusiasm, I bounded in. Immediately, if not sooner, it happened. It hit the fan. In all, perhaps three minutes, I had no hair, was in a baggy green flight suit, and I was outside. So that's how these guys got here. Staff Sergeant E.J. Watkins, United States Marine Corps, bellowed, Welcome, sweetheart. And that's how I got there. It was the start of a journey for which I, like many of you, will be forever grateful. For those who have gone before and are now serving, thank you. And to those young men and women we interviewed, I trust the journey will not disappoint. A sincere salute and my admiration to all my fellow veterans and to our families that supported us as we chased our dreams. I can also assure you that when any veteran is asked to stand to be recognized, we do so with an intense pride that still dwells deep within. God bless all of you and God bless America. Thank you. Before I introduce this year's city veteran honoree, I would like to say a few words about him. Officer Bernier has served in the United States Army since 2008. Five years he was the, uh, with the 101st Airborne at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Later, he served two combat deployments in Afghanistan to support Operation Enduring Freedom. In 2013, he transitioned to the Army Reserve as a combat engineer. Officer Bernier joined the Sanibel Police Force in 2017. In 2019, he was recognized as one of Lee County Officers of the Year. Additionally, he has been awarded commendations for life saving. 
I'd like to invite Max to come up and say a few words. Thank you. All right, thank you everybody for being here today. I'm Magdale Bernier. I go by Max. I'm a city employee for the city of Santa Mel Police Department. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank God. I'd like to thank you all for being here, and I'd like to thank my family, because uh, honestly, without them, I wouldn't be here where I am right now. Um, I appreciate the city allowing me to be uh, showcased for the most part as the city of Sanibel veteran. Um, so I really do just want to make the rest of the veterans that are employed here through the city of Sanibel proud. Um, there's not much else to add as to my bio for what I've done. Um, I proudly serve and I'm currently proudly still serving at the moment. Uh, right now I've been in the city of Sanibel law enforcement officer for the last three years. Within the last three years I've trained a lot, I've learned a lot, and I continue to want to excel within the city of Sanibel. Uh, for my military background, um, I proudly served with the 101st Airborne from 20, 2008 excuse me, till 2013, uh, where I did two combat deployments uh, and a couple of hardships overseas. Uh, I'm currently now serving out of Cape Coral, 365th Combat Engineers as a combat engineer. Um, hopefully I'll be there till I retire, which I only got about eight years now. Um, there's not much else to say for our veterans that are out here today and that uh, have been out in the past and that will continue to be in the future. Uh, that allows and transitions easily into law enforcement where I am now. That we serve a thin blue line here as a law enforcement officer as we served a green line in uh, the military. So thank you all for being here and thank you all for showcasing me. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. And now we come to one of the favorite parts of our program, the Veterans Remembrances. And we're gonna to have to do that a little different this year due to the circumstances. So first of all, I was notified of the passing of Robert W. Jones by his brothers in the American Legion Post 1 to 23, and I'd like to uh, recognize him. Jonesy's love for the sea drove him to join the Coast Guard where he was stationed in Cape May, New Jersey. During his service, he was a fit ed teacher for the Coast Guard basketball team. His motto was service above self, which he practiced in everyday life. He spent most of his life on Cape Cod until 2004 when he relocated to Sanibel. He was an active member of the American Legion Post 123. His larger than life personality could light up a room and he'll truly be missed. Joe Venuto was in the Navy from January of 1943 to August of 1946. He was a Lieutenant. He was in the South Pacific. He was a gunnery officer on a destroyer. Please welcome Joe Venuto. Good morning. I'm going to be uh, not talking about any naval maneuvers or anything. I'm going to be talking about a weird event that occurred just after the war. As you might surmise, after an armistice, you know, there's a lot of work to be done for re relocating officers, ships, and etc. And I was hoping, that being a Naval Reserve, that I would receive discharge and be coming home. But lo and behold, they came up with a duty, which I'll describe briefly. Our destroyer was made for headquarters for all of the destroyers in the Pacific. In about oh, a week after the armistice, he called three of the lieutenants aboard our ship to meet with him in his office. And we did that, and he gave us this message. He says, the U.S. authorities in China, which was our ally at that time, have requested help to transport some 2,000 troops from Saigon, French Indochina, to Manchuria to two cities, Tinsin and Qingwantao. And the U.S. agreed to do that. Well, the ships that we were going to use were LSTs, landing ship tank, and they were sitting in the Subic Bay in the Philippines. So off the three officers went up. We tried to pick the best, there were about 20 of them there waiting decommissioned in Subic Bay. We got our supplies and they did supply us with seamen and engineers to help run the ship. We went down to Saigon and we could hold about 200 to 250 per trip. 
we got there and all of these soldiers, Chinese soldiers, were going around buying food for the three and a half day trip. And what they did is buy dried fish. And we on our ship took some three 55 gallon galvanized drums and took the rice that they brought with us and we steamed it. That's what they did for the entire trip. Well, our first trip from Saigon to Tin Sin was very uneventful. But on the way back from that first trip, we were abreast Shanghai about 40 miles out. And I happened to have the midnight to four shift. And I noticed a light off the starboard bow. It was quite a ways away when I first noticed it. And lo and behold, it sort of kept a steady bearing. Well, as you know, that's not good. So the ships in the Navy, if you're in a convoy, the most senior executive is always the lead ship and the commander of the, the convoy. I was the least senior, so I was the last of the three ships. That becomes important in a minute. So what happens is that uh, the, this bearing continued for quite a while. And I noticed the ship wasn't moving very fast. And then realizing that the lead ship had some very junior officers above it, other than the captain. And I said, I wonder if he realizes what's going on. So I took the liberty to call them and told them that we had had a steady bearing for X time. And do they have any maneuvering plans? And he says, I'll call you back. You could tell he was nervous and also sort of indicated to me he's probably one of the junior officers who was reluctant to make a decision. So, uh, after about 10 minutes, which seemed like hours, we got a call telling us to all maneuver to the left of the port side at about a 45 degree angle in order to not miss him. And then about, uh, oh, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes later, that vehicle ship came in sight and it was a big sailing Chinese junk. And we were saying, what the hell is it doing out there? Actually, our course off the coast of China so that we didn't meet any traffic. Well, lo and behold, as he got closer, we could see more clearly who was on board and so forth. And then he turned right to try to get closer. Of course, the last ship being me. And so finally we took, and I sort of jacked it up a little bit speed wise but they got within about, well, I'd say 300 yards of us when they passed south of us. And what I saw was what looked like Chinese pirates. And what we had heard later is that, is that this was not unusual. It had been happening. Oh, and uh, so uh, what happened is that uh, we did miss them. And I called the captain of the other ship the next day and said, do you know about this? Yeah, it's happened less frequently, but they aren't gonna hurt you. He said, they come on board fully manned and they know there's not many on. Usually on an LST, all there is is about the guy who's the officer of the day, a seaman and somebody in the engineering rooms. So they, they would come aboard and request to take your food and your liquor and they'd go. And I thought that was sort of an interesting story. And we did the rest of the, uh, the voyage to get the 2,000 troops up north. And then we thought about that time, gee, maybe I'm ready to go home now, discharge. Lo and behold, the next assignment they gave us is to take and decommission the LSTs that we were on. So I took a while. But that's, that was it. That's the end of my story. <laughs> Major General James Dozier, U.S. Army, retired, is a bona fide American hero. In Vietnam, he was wounded and awarded the Silver Star for heroism. As a Brigadier General in 1981, he was kidnapped from his apartment in Verona, Italy, by an Italian Red Brigade's terrorist cell and held for 42 days. During his 35 years of military service with the U.S. Army and NATO, he served in the United States, Europe, and Asia. He was born in Arcadia, and after joining the Florida Air, or not 
the Florida National Guard, he was awarded an appointment to West Point, where he was later a professor. He has long been a leader in community groups and veterans organizations, especially our Lee Coast chapter of the Military Officers Association of America, which actually was originally chartered here on Sanibel. General Dozier, we really appreciate you joining us today. Thank you, Fred, and I promise to be mercifully brief. <clears throat> I've had the honor of serving our country in three wars, Korea, the Cold War, and in Vietnam. In Vietnam, I served in the Armored Cavalry Regiment, the 11th ACR, commanded by then Colonel George Patton who was the son of the World War II uh, heroic George Patton. <clears throat> Our area of responsibility was all of the area north of Saigon up to the Cambodian border. And we acted as the fire brigade for two field force, which is a core sized organization responsible for that area. For the first six months of our tour, we fought the Viet Cong, who were very courageous and good fighters. The second half of the tour, we fought the North Vietnamese Army. We would pick them up at the Cambodian border, fight them for a little bit, and then turn them over to the Army of South Vietnam, who uh, by that time, had turned into a pretty good fighting outfit. We always had a, an army of, of South Vietnam Ranger Battalion attached to us. They were also very good fighters. One day, General Patton, and then Colonel Patton, and I visited the headquarters of our Ranger Battalion. As we walked into the mess hall, right in front of us was this sign, which says that those who have never lost it and have never had to fight to regain it can never know the true meaning of the word freedom. In big red letters on that sign was the word freedom and little green letters were the words that I just read. But down at the bottom were little letters that said, thank you, America, because there were two Americans, advisors, helping that, that Arvin Ranger Battalion uh, fight for the freedoms that, that they were then fighting for. The unit was commanded by a middle-aged Vietnamese captain who had been fighting for the freedom of his country for most of his adult life. The takeaway that I took from this particular sign was that freedom is not free. It is always worth fighting for. And those we honor today did just that and they deserve our sincere thanks. So thank you all for being here today, and God bless America. As we mentioned earlier, our honoree for this year's ceremony is Ed Seaver. He was a Naval Flight Officer stationed on the U.S. Bennington. At 23 years old, in April 1945, his group of four aircraft was first on site to attack the largest ship built at that time, the Japanese battleship Yamoto. He was flying a hell diver, which is a dive bomber, and they dived at 90 degrees to their target. He was the first one in, and he made a direct hit on one of the main gun turrets. For that mission, he was awarded the Silver Star. Earlier, he had been awarded two distinguished flying crosses and four airmen. I was privileged to know Ed, and Ed was a pilot's pilot and a gentleman's gentleman. Now our mission is complete, 
Thanks for joining us today. Please remember our veterans. And we're going to close with a special rendition of TAPS.